The arrival of critical theory in the post-war era introduced a range of complex disciplines such as linguistics, literary criticism, psychoanalytic criticism, structuralism, and post-colonialism. These new approaches challenged the prevailing liberal consensus that dominated criticism in the 1930s and the 40s. Among these discourses, structuralism and post-structuralism that emerged in France during 1950s were particularly controversial. Their impact led to a crisis in English studies in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Unlike focusing on history or authorship, these movements prioritized language and philosophy as their main areas of interest. In the 1950s, structuralism emerged as a significant challenge to new criticism and Sartre's existentialism, which emphasized radical human freedom. Instead, structuralism focused on how cultural, social, and psychological structures shape human behavior. It aimed to provide a comprehensive approach to understanding human life that could encompass various disciplines. Scholars like Rola Barth, Jacques Derrida, explored the application of structuralist principles to literature. Jacques Lacan examined psychology through the lens of structuralism, blending the ideas of Freud and Saussure. Michel Foucault's work, The Order of Things, investigated the history of science to analyze the structures of epistemology, although he later distanced himself from the structuralist movement. Louis Althusser combined Marxism with structuralism to develop his unique form of social analysis. In a broader sense, therefore, structuralism is a perspective that views the world in terms of interconnected structures. It first emerged in the works of anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss and literary critic Rolla Barth. At its core, structuralism posits that objects or phenomena cannot be fully understood in isolation, but must be examined within the larger structures to which they belong. These structures are not independent entities, but are shaped by our perception of the world. In the realm of structuralist criticism, the emphasis shifts from interpreting individual literary works to comprehending the overarching structures that encompass them. For instance, when analyzing John Donne's poem The Good Morrow through a structuralist lens, greater attention is given to the relevant genre such as the Alba or Dawn Song and the concept of courtly love, rather than solely focusing on close readings of the poem's formal elements. The central tenet of structuralism, which asserts that all human activities are constructed rather than natural or essential, is evident in the foundational works in this field. Alongside pioneers such as Lévi-Strauss and Barth, significant contributors to structuralism include A.J. Grimes, Vladimir Propp, Terence Hawkes, known for his work on structuralism and semiotics, Robert Scholes, who explored structuralism in literature, Colin McCabe, Frank Kermode, and David Lodge, who combined traditional and structuralist approaches in his book Working with Structuralism. In the United States during the 1960s, prominent American structuralists included Jonathan Culler and semioticians such as C.A.S. Pierce, Charles Morris, and Noam Chomsky. By emphasizing scientific categorization, structuralism highlights the interconnectedness of units, that is, surface phenomena, and rules, that is, the principles governing the arrangement of units. Within language, units correspond to words, while rules pertain to the grammatical structures that organize those words. The artwork, titled This is Not a Pipe, by the Belgian surrealist artist René Magri, explores the deceptive nature of science and can be viewed as a foundational element in structuralism. In Michel Foucault's book of the same title, he reflects on the painting, and emphasizes the inherent contradiction between visual representation and reality. Saussure's linguistic theory highlights the arbitrary and relational nature of meanings. This is exemplified through various examples, such as the reference to the 8.2 Geneva to Paris Express in his book Course in General Linguistics, 
the paradigmatic chain of words like hovel, shed, hut, house, mansion, palace, where meaning is dependent on their position in the chain, and the dyads of opposites like male, female, day, night, where each unit's definition relies on its opposite. Saussure's theory establishes that language rather than human beings or reality constructs the world. In his lectures, Saussure employed several binary oppositions, with one important example being speech slash writing. He gives priority to speech as it ensures subjectivity and presence, while writing, according to Saussure, signifies absence of both the speaker and the signified. Derrida critiqued this perspective as phonocentrism, which excessively favors presence over absence, leading him to question the validity of all centers. Saussure's distinction between lang, that is language as a system, and parole, that is an individual utterance in that language which is considered inferior to lang, provided structuralists with a framework for understanding the larger structures relevant to literature. Structuralist narratology, a branch of structuralism advocated by Vladimir Propp, Svetan Todorov, Rola Barth, and Gerard Genet, illustrates how the meaning of a story emerges from its overall structure, that is, long, rather than from the isolated themes of individual stories, that is, per whole. To determine the meaning of a text, narratologists emphasize grammatical elements such as verb tenses and the relationships and configurations of figures of speech within the story. This shift demonstrates a move in structuralism from focusing on authorial intention to examining broader impersonal linguistic structures in which the author's text participates. Structuralist critics approach literature by employing the explicit framework of structuralist linguistics. In their analysis, they draw upon the linguistic theory of Saussure as well as the semiotic theory formulated by Saussure and the American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce. According to semiotic theory, language should be studied in its own right. And Saussure proposes that the study of language should be situated within the broader domains of semiology, which is the science of signs. Semiology recognizes that the meaning of a word arises solely from its differentiation from other words within the sign system of language. Example, rain as distinct from brain, sprain, rail, roam, or rain. All signs are cultural constructs that have acquired their meaning through repeated learned and collective usage. The process of communication constitutes an ongoing chain of sign production which we are referred to as unlimited semiosis. The distinctions between symbolic, iconic, and indexical signs introduced by the literary theorist Charles Sanders Peirce are also significant notions within semiology. Additionally, semiotics encompasses other key concepts such as denotation, that is first-order signification, and connotation, that is second-order signification. The foundations of structuralism can be traced back to the earlier approach of myth-criticism pioneered by scholars like Notre Fry, Richard Chase, Leslie Fiddler, Daniel Hoffman, and Philip Wheelwright. These scholars explored the anthropological and physiological aspects of myths, rituals, and folk tales in order to revive the spiritual significance within a modern world dominated by scientism, empiricism, and technology. Myth criticism views literature as a system characterized by recurring patterns, seeking to uncover the underlying structures and meanings within literary works. Due to the close relationship between linguistics and literary theory, Saussure's ideas in linguistics found ready application in the study of literature. When employing structuralism to analyze a literary text, it becomes linked to a broader structure. This structure may encompass the text's genre or the universal storytelling patterns observed worldwide. In this scenario, the structuralist examines the text in search of recurring themes or patterns. The underlying notion is that human consciousness possesses universal characteristics 
and it falls upon the literary critic to identify and elucidate them. Any literary work can be dissected into its fundamental components, allowing for a comparison with other narratives sharing a similar structural framework. As an illustration, consider the familiar plotline of boy meets girl, girl faces some form of peril, boy comes to the rescue. This narrative structure is recurrent in both literary works and films. Regardless of the specific writing style employed, be it an epic poem, a novel or a play, the fundamental elements of the story remain unchanged. It embodies the timeless essence of a classic tale involving a hero, a conflict or tension and a resolution. Hence, a novel, poem or painting unveils insights into something profound, the underlying framework of consciousness. According to structuralists, the fundamental structures that organize rules and components into coherent systems originate from the human mind, rather than being solely derived from sensory perception. Consequently, our minds process information in a manner that assigns significance, thus imbuing it with meaning. It is the very nature of the mind to derive meaning from the world surrounding us. Structuralism employs fundamental inquiries to interpret literary texts, such as do patterns observed in text A bear resemblance to those found in text B? Structuralism seeks out similarities across texts. Does the text present contrasting elements set in opposition to one another? In structuralism, such contrasting pairs are referred to as binary oppositions, encompassing concepts like good slash evil, light slash dark, tall slash short, and so on. According to Terry Eagleton's book, Literary Theory, published in 1983, structuralism embodies a relentless process of demystifying literature. This implies that when structuralism is employed to analyze a literary text, it peels away its aesthetic form and subjective meaning, reducing it to its essential elements. What remains is solely the underlying structure. Eagleton writes, The literary work, like any other product of language, is a construct whose mechanisms could be classified and analyzed like the objects of any other science. In this regard, structuralism is overtly opposed to individuality and to some extent dismisses the significance of the artist. It does not focus on individuality or artistic creativity as isolated entities, nor as distinct reflections of an author's personality. Its sole concern lies in the underlying and communal structures of consciousness inherent in works of art or literature. It is an approach that seeks to unify, yet in its unifying efforts, it also erases distinctions. This notion is encapsulated in Rolla Barthes' renowned essay, The Death of the Author, published in 1977. Let's consider a well-known example. Romeo and Juliet, published in 1597. Undoubtedly, the story is exquisitely crafted with its memorable language and global stage adaptations. However, when we distill it to its core elements, the narrative is rather straightforward. Boy meets girl, they fall in love, they tragically end their own lives. In addition, there exists a concurrent plotline, a feud between two families. These two narrative layers intertwine, mutually influencing one another throughout the play. The prologue furnishes the overarching structure for the entire piece. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows do with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. The which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. 
A structuralist interpretation directs attention toward the overarching plot and the binary oppositions embedded within the play. In the case of Romeo and Juliet, the primary binary opposition revolves around love slash hate, which permeates the entire narrative through the contrasting dynamics of Romeo and Juliet's love for one another versus the intense animosity between the two feuding families. The fundamental characteristics of structuralism in literary theory can be summarized as follows. Emphasis on the underlying structure of a literary text. The idea that meaning is derived from the interconnectedness of the various elements within the text. Binary oppositions play a crucial role in comprehending the text. The author's individuality and personality hold little significance. The focus lies on the profound structures at play. Literary texts are constructed entities. Meaning does not solely originate from within the text itself. Rather, it emerges from the interrelations between different parts of the text.